I'm going to answer this one question. How many of you have ever wondered, is Islam basically a peaceful religion or a violent religion? I see one or two people here that aren't thinking, but no, no, everybody's, everybody's had this question. I had this question. What I want you to leave today, although, yeah, we're talking, you know, mind, soul, strength, and heart. I want you to leave with your mind understanding this, and I think I can make it really clear for you. Some of you probably have Muslim neighbors or friends, or you work with Muslims and you think they're really nice and peaceful. Granted, if you got into a deep discussion with them, you might find out they believe some things about violence that they don't practice. But on the whole, you would think they are peaceful. And frankly, more than 90% of the Muslims I've met in America really are peaceful. They want to live the average nice, um, basically American life with all our benefits. They don't want to kill us or destroy anything. And many times, if not most of those people, they accept the entire Quran. And they quote verses from the Quran like this. How many of you have heard this verse? There is to be no compulsion in religion. Has anyone heard that before? Okay, some of you have. When there is any kind of interfaith group, or if a Muslim is addressing America, this is one of the top verses they will quote. There are several others like that. And you look at that and think, what are people talking about? What do you mean there's no compulsion in religion? What, this stuff about killing apostates, it must be nonsense. Or Christians being forced to convert, it, it can't be true. Well, how can that be? Hmm. Let's check the Islamic sources. This is a small part of my Islamic library, maybe 15%. So I did check the sources. Not only that, I studied with native Arabic speakers who have learned this, who are expert, including a Palestinian I work with, including Abuna Zakaria, Father Zachariah, who's very well known. And if you want to read works by Hassan al-Banna, who's the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, you will see how these are quoted. Arabic is my first language that's helped me a lot to have more access to, uh, to, to Islamic sources and books and uh, that things that are not necessarily available um, in English. But uh, praise God that many, many of this material today uh, are available in English too. But I, I praise God uh, that my language is Arabic and I was able to access it in Arabic because I, I see that game being played all the time. Oh, this is wrong translation. Oh, you don't know Arabic. Then, no, I know Arabic and this is my first language. Uh, and I understand exactly the concept of this uh, idea when uh, Muhammad ordered the killing, when to, uh, he ordered, is it really just defending themselves or not? No, absolutely. Muhammad was ordering his people to conquer for the sake of Allah. The teaching of Islam on violence is very, very clear. Absolutely, Islam commands violence. Uh, the cutting of hands, the crucifixion, the uh, cutting of necks, uh, it's described in details. But the Quran is very small part of the teaching of Islam. Uh, the majority of the teaching of Islam and how to do things is found in the Hadith and the life of Muhammad. And Muslims are commanded to follow Muhammad as an example to all mankind. If Muhammad actions disagree with the Quran, they will go with his action, not the Quran. For example, the Quran says the penalty of adultery is 100 lashes. But Muslims practice stoning. Why? Because Muhammad practices stoning. What Muhammad done in every situation, they will do the same. Now, if you want to deal with violence in Islam, you cannot ignore the Hadith like what Muslims in the West are trying to do. Oh, we follow the words of Allah, the Quran. No, they follow the Hadith as well. Prayers, how to pray, is found in the Hadith, it's not in the Quran. The Shihada, the confession of faith, no God but Allah, Muhammad, his prophet, completely not found as it as is in the Quran. It ha they have to go in the Hadith. 
Many things they have to go to the Hadith. Let's go to the violence in the Hadith, the actions of Muhammad. A woman wrote a poem about Muhammad. He was so angry at her. She knew he can, what he can do to her. She came and asked for forgiveness. He said he forgive her. Later on, he ordered his people to go after her. They tie her into two camels. 85 years old lady, he cut her in half. That's an actions of a prophet. Loving, peaceful religion. I, I don't see that. Uh, another man, he hid his money. I, I believe he stole the money and he hid it. And Muhammad, he wanted to get him to talk about where the money is. He cut him to pieces to the point that he, he, they make uh, iron pieces very hot and they poked his eyes uh, until he, they made him confess where he hid the money from them. There's 164 clear verses about violence in the Quran. They cannot water down these Quranic verses. But in chapter 3, verse 28, there is something called taqiyah. Muslims are giving the permission to lie and deceive if they are in the land of the enemy or if they are in the time of war. Today, there's a lot of different translations of the Quran. Uh, I, I love that uh, website called readquranonline.org. Quran, Q-U-R-A-N, uh, read quranonline.org. When you go to that website, when you search for any verse, it gives you over 30 different translations to compare. Uh, it's, it's really awesome. Uh, the second translation there, his name is Ahmed Ali, I believe. Uh, he is one of the best there. Like what, a lot of the printed Qurans today uh, in Surah 929, it says, uh, fight uh, the Christian and Jews, fight the people of the book. But Arabic, it says, qital. Qital is uh, to be done by the sword. It cannot be a fight that by the speech or the pen, it must be done by the sword, always by the sword. Um, th this is one of the key words that they, they trying to water down in their translations to attract Western, to deceive Western, that's part of the deception. The word jihad in America, they always claim it means struggle, internal struggle against sin. Is that the case? And the concept of sin Islam is to struggle against sin, I don't know how that can be possible. But it is a struggle in the concept of the Bible. When Paul say, I fought the good fight in Arabic, in the Christian Arabic Bible, it says jihad to jihad al-hasan is the same word. Yes, it is a struggle. But in the concept of Islam, it's not a struggle against sin. It's a struggle of how should I keep the money for myself or invest it for the sake of Allah, to buy weapons, buy stuff for the sake of Allah. Should I keep my children for myself or send my children to die in jihad? Muhammad mentioned a story, very well-known story. He said, he talked about this lady. She had seven kids. She sent her first son and died in the jihad. She did not cry. She did not even uh, have one tear. She said the second one. She didn't, and died, and she did not cry. She sent the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. She sent them all, and they died. All the six, six of them, the first six died, and she never cried. She sent number seven, and he died, and she stopped crying. People were amazed. Do you love this per one more than the rest? She said, no, I am crying because I have no longer children to send to die for Allah. That's the struggle we're talking about in Islam. There's stages in jihad. In the beginning, it was defensive. It was just to defend themselves. Uh, but later, it was uh, more to conquer, to go after the people, uh, to take lands. But after that, also it became to the point where you become a Muslim or you, you die. There's a period of time where they give you three choices uh, to become a Muslim, to pay jizya, not tax, protection money. Tax is zakat. Jizya is protection money. They come to your country, they conquer your country, you become a second class citizen, you pay money to be protected or to become a Muslim or to die. One of the three choices you have. Very clear. When Muhammad died, many Muslims want to leave Islam. Many people because they were forced to become Muslim. When Muhammad died, they thought it's over, they want to leave Islam. Abu Bakr, the first successor, enforced hukm al-ridda, the punishment, the law of, of uh, leaving Islam. If you left Islam, you will die. 
Also, when we come to the topic of jihad, even Muhammad himself, we need to remember always what Muhammad does and what Muhammad says is really essential for every Muslim because the Quran says Muhammad is an example to all mankind. Muhammad says his main desire, his main heart desire is to die in jihad and come back to life and die in jihad and come back to life and die in jihad and come back to life. He said this is the most thing that he desired to, 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 have, to be done to him is to die for the sake of Allah. This is the key. This is the key. Plug it in your mind and you will go home contented on this question. The key is the doctrine of abrogation. The doctrine of abrogation can be found in the Quran, in surah or chapter or book. They're all basically the same thing. Surah number two, that's al-Baqarah, which means the cow. And in verse 106, it gives a verse which says, Allah never sends a new verse. Um, he never cancels a verse unless he sends something better in its place. So from this developed this doctrine of abrogation. Very secular Muslims don't know this. A lot of American-born Muslims have never been bothered to teach this to their children, so they don't know it. We have done surveys on campuses with American Muslims, and they're shocked by this. In fact, it's upsetting to them. But if the later revelations replace the earlier ones, what does that mean in practice? Well, each sect has a different list of what's abrogated, but up to two-thirds of the Quran is abrogated by this. Any verse that you've heard anyone ever quote that's peaceful, like we've made you of tribes and people so you can know each other, all these kind of friendly things are abrogated. And this Palestinian evangelist I work with has even has even confronted people that we've seen at the meeting, like imams, and he says, you're quoting abrogated verses, and the imam will admit, admits he knows that. So any very educated Muslim will know about this doctrine. Again, a lot of the nominal ones will not. But why does this make a difference? Early in, in Muhammad's ministry in Mecca, he received peaceful revelations. He was in the minority, and he had to make peace with the Christians and the Jews. He, he did confront the idol worshipers. That was a big problem for him. But on the whole, he was peaceful. So he said, you can believe whatever you want, but I am coming from God, from Allah, the one true God, with a revelation that says, return to the worship of the one true God. And he really thought that he was a kind of prophet that the Christians and the Jews would come to follow. So he was doing a really good PR in Mecca. Then the Hejira in 622, he went to Medina. He was given power by the people of Medina and everything changed. The revelations started to become violent. According to him, God gave him permission to attack caravans, to, do, um, to protect himself against unbelievers and actually to attack unbelievers. There are many verses like that. So what are the verses we get? In Medina, that's where you get Surah 9. If you have a Quran, read Surah 9 if you want to read about the, um, the spoils of war. It says, fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them. And also, um, verse 5, several verses in there are very violent. And there are other violent verses I can talk to you about later. So at that point, Muhammad didn't begin fighting people. And once you get this, you will understand why some people are peaceful and others aren't. Well, the Quran and other sources, in fact, a, a Quran that I bring here at the back with the commentary in it says, jihad is incumbent, it is required of all Muslims. And that is violent jihad. It's hard to get that Quran now because it's non-PC, but you're, well to look, you're welcome to look at it. But that is the truth of it. According to the Quran and the commentaries, Shia, Sunni, you are required for violent jihad. So if you think about it, devout Muslims are studying these sources. 
because they're taking it seriously. They're reading the Quran. They're reading the documents of their faith, all kinds of different ones. Besides the Hadith, there are other ones, biographies of Muhammad and different commentaries and um, Islamic jurisprudence over the years. So if they're sincere and they're reading this, what are they going to do? Are they going to become more peaceful and loving their enemies? Or are they going to become more polarized and more violent? If you believe the whole Quran, you will have a tendency to accept the peaceful verses. You might be really confused because you're seeing both mixed messages there. But if you are a devout Muslim and you know that the later revelations from Medina cancel those from Mecca, you are going to, of necessity, be violent. One famous apostate who was a professor in Egypt was studying more and more to teach his classes, and he kept trying to explain away the violence. He couldn't. So finally, he did become a believer. I can tell you who that is after. There are quite few verses that sound very peaceful in the Quran, and maybe they are peaceful in the Quran, but for you to know how can the Quran ha contain peaceful verses and violent verses in the same time, you need to understand something called abrogation. In Islam, there's a verse that talks about Allah uh, saying, none of our verses we abrogate in, in, unless if we send uh, something similar or better, but actually he's not sending similar and better, he's sending a uh, contradicting message, a completely different message. When Muslims were weak in the beginning, they were in Mecca, they were the minority, they were, Muhammad was preaching very peaceful message. But when they went, uh, when he flee for his life, he ran for his life, he went to Medina and, and uh, he becoming more and more bigger and uh, stronger, he start uh, counseling and changing his mind about the peaceful verses. He start preaching uh, violent and uh, he, he started realizing that he's contradicting himself. Uh, that's why he came out with the theology abrogation. When Allah speaks now, he will counsel what he spoke before. For example, if you, if you ask Muslims that, they're usually uh, trying to deny it and uh, lie about it. But I usually use another abrogated verses, verse that has nothing to do with violence. For example, there's a verse in the Quran that says, don't come to the prayer while you are drunk. This is, every Muslim now, this verse being abrogated, today no Muslim is allowed to drink at all, period. They are not allowed to drink. Once I use that verse, oh, you can come to the prayer while you're, but as long as you're not drunk, you can drink, but you don't come to the prayer while you're drunk. They say, no, 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 we are not allowed to drink at all. But this verse in the Quran, my friend, they say, no, no, no this verse is being abrogated because people used to be addicted to alcohol. Uh, it was steps uh, for them first. You can uh, start drinking a little bit less, but don't come to the prayer while drunk. And later they change their mind. He changes, uh, or this verse being canceled and abrogated. Uh, once I establish that with the Muslim, then I will uh, I will start bringing the other verses. This way, he he himself or she herself admitted the abrogation idea in the Quran. But there is. Uh, Verses like, say, no compulsion of religion. This verse is absolutely being abrogated. Surah 929, they call it the sword verse. That one verse abrogated 125 verses in the Quran. There is great books I recommend to you. There is Litqan fi Ilum al-Quran, Imam Siyuti. There is a book it called Azbab um, al-Nuzul. Uh, uh, reason of Revelation of the Quran by Siyut as well. This is a really good book to talk about which verse is being abrogated. Uh, I really recommend if you are uh, focusing toward reaching out to Muslims, this is excellent books. But there is a verse that they always drive me crazy when they use. A verse about whoever killed one man, like killing entire humanity. Uh, they use it in our media. They use it everywhere they go to show that Islam does not permit the killing even if one man. There's two problems. The first is, if you read few, just one or two verses prior, you will find out here this is directed to the Jews. The Quran or Allah talking about was given to the Jews, whoever killed one man like killing entire humanity. That's not to the Muslims, that's an order to the Jews. That's number one. Number two, 
in the end of that verse, even if we say that verse is for Muslims to follow, in the end of that verse, there's a couple words they will always not mention. They will cut the verse short. That is unjustly. If you, whoever kill man, one man unjustly, like killing entire humanity. In the eyes of Islam, killing infidels, that they are uh, sending military overseas is justified. Just killing infidels for being infidels, according to chapter 929, for not following the, religious of, the religion of truth, Islam, they deserve to be put to death. Also, killing Muslims that lives in this country, paying tax to this country, they deserve to be killed according to Islam. It's okay. It's justifiable all, as well to be, to be done to them. Because they say that all the time. How these hijackers are good, can be good Muslims? How can they be Muslims if they kill Muslims? Since the time of Muhammad, Muslims always kill Muslims. The, sec, the third and the fourth successor of Islam was killed by the Muslims. 73 family members of Muhammad were killed by Muslims. Muhammad, even close relatives, were killed by Muslims. This is not something new. The claim that Islam is a religion of peace, this is absolutely false claim. But in the same time, if we want to see the definition of the word peace, is what, what really peace meant? Peace is the, uh, the absence of the opposition, that they have to get rid of the opposition, their enemy completely done with, and then Islam is what you have at that time. Uh, for example, you have the choice of being in the house of war if you're not a, no, you are not a Muslim, but if you are um, in Islam, you will have peace. That's the choices you have. But let's see the history of Islam. The day Muhammad, the day Muhammad died, war started between Aisha, his youngest wife. She was six years old when he married her, or seven or eight years. Or different is based on which sources you are reading. But she led a war against Muhammad's cousin. Over thousands of people died in a few days, just after Muhammad's death. Islam entirely, from the beginning, started with the sword. Show me one Islamic country today that have peace. Not even one country without violence, without problems. Islam did not succeed to bring any peace in any Islamic nation today. They come to the West and they want to turn the West just like the Middle East. Then what's the difference if it's going to become just like another Islamic country? We have peace in the United States because of the infidels that protecting I, I don't understand this. I was required to memorize and to study the Quran in period of time, not the entire time. Uh, there was a lot of, we went through a lot of changes of governments uh, during the time I was in Sudan. There's a time that we were required to study Islam and if we succeed to escape uh, the class, uh, to not go to the Islamic class, they will insert Islam in the Arabic language, they will insert Islam in history, they will insert Islam in geography, and any opportunity they have, they will try to push Islam in us. One of my friends, he, was, he, he died in the class because the teacher uh, hit him in the whip to the, uh, so hard to the point that the end of the whip uh, hit him in his kidney and he stopped have eternal bleeding and he died. And the teacher coming to the class the next day like nothing happened. Uh, the, the blood of the Christians being shed, uh, like if it's permitted, if anyone will kill them, they, there's a period of time that's what, what happened in Sudan. Uh, if someone kill a Christian, will not be punished for killing a Christian. The Islamic movement, they trying to bring more the spirit of the early Islam back again to our school, and that's what's the problem. But uh, the Sudanese themselves, as, as people, they are very kind and loving people. It's absolutely the final commands and marching orders of Muhammad is to conquer for Allah, is to take over every nation, every, the whole world will submit to Islam. And today we're seeing all across the world things, actions like that. But there's a different war as well. They are taking the world over the world by deception. 
Islam is spreading in the United States in an unbelievable way. It's shocking to me. After September 11, more people convert to Islam in the United States and the West more than ever before. Why? Because our media giving them chance and opportunity to come and speak. It just is amazing what I'm hearing on, on the radio, false teaching after false teaching and people uh, just accepting this stuff. And this is, uh, is very, very sad. When Muslims get challenged about the commands in the Quran to wage jihad, to wage holy war, they'll say, oh, well, that's just like the Old Testament wars. Well, no, there's, there's a great, great difference. In the Quran, Muhammad was given a, a green light from Allah to wage war in the name of Islam for the purpose of spreading Islam and conquering the world for Islam. There was never a command given to the Jews, the ancient Jews, to conquer the whole world for God. It is true that there were certain select nations, ancient nations that lived in the land that at that time was called Canaan, and those nations were doing some very evil things, most specifically taking babies and offering them on the altar to their pagan god. So God did command the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Jews, to displace those nations and discontinue them as a nationality, and then the, the, the Jews moved, and that's, this is what they called the promised land. But that's very different from the command to just go all over the world and conquer. But a lot of times people say, well, the Quran talks about war, the Old Testament talks about war, they're all the same. No, the, the reasons people go to war are what are different. Jesus Christ sent us out with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that is what is able to cut between the soul and the spirit the bone and the marrow, it divides. It searches and cuts through the intents of the heart. So we have God's word as a spiritual sword, symbolically, not a literal sword. Never does the Bible teach the New Testament Christians to go out in violence or use any kind of force or, or coercion to bring people into the faith. God wants a person to worship him in spirit and in truth and not to be coerced or intimidated into the faith. I want to address a specific question to him. Pastor George, some Americans have heard of the concept of booty of war. And I want to ask you about that from the Islamic sources. What does it say? Are Americans really liable to be booty of war? Is there some thought of that in Islam? It's absolutely uh, in the teaching of Islam that whatever uh, whenever that the country, Islamic leaders take over a country, whatever belong to that country belong to the Muslims now. Uh, they be, it teaches that uh, women, uh, Christian women, non-Muslim women, are property of Muslims. Uh, very clear in the teaching of Islam that uh, they have the right, even uh, the Quran, it talks about, uh, there's a verse, um, it doesn't show that clearly, but when you go to the commentary, you will understand it. Uh, this verse says, don't forbid what God permitted, which is uh, when you go to the Hadith, you will find out uh, the reason uh, of this verse is a Muslim just conquer a city and the Muslim people refuse to rape and uh, take these young ladies and pregnant women as their property. But Allah revealed a verse saying to them, do not forbid what God permitted. God permit you to go ahead and rape them. They are your property. You can do whatever you want to them. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely in the Quran. It's absolutely uh, even more clear in uh, when we see the practice that Muhammad practiced as an example to all mankind. We can see that all across the Islamic teaching, through history, every time Muslims conquer a country, they right away take the women, they take their properties, become Muslims' property. Can you say if that is only if they have already invaded, or are there some Muslims in America that might think that they have a right to anything we have now since we are not invaded yet? Actually, we were standing in front of the mosque uh, in Romulus, I believe, uh, at that time, and 
uh, I was talking to a Muslim man and there's another Muslim man was talking to my wife and uh, this Muslim man he telling my wife that she gonna be one of his wives in heaven and he was talking to her as if it is she's his and and he, she told him to stop here she, he, my husband's right here say I know my, your husband is right here but when I start hearing them, I have to stop him from talking to my wife, but I knew exactly what he was doing. He was claiming her as his, his property because we are not Muslims, then my wife can be his. What about a reformation of Islam? Is there a hope that Islam could be reformed? Remember, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on in the church before the Protestant Reformation. And then what happened? People started reading the Bible, remember? Martin Luther was told, well, you have a problem. You might want to read the Bible. It was kind of an unusual thing to do. But he started reading the Bible. And he had one of these aha moments about what the true life of faith is and what grace is in God. So that changed all of how Christianity is practiced. Some people have thought, well, couldn't that happen in Islam? I mean, if they really go back there and study that there's no compulsion in religion, couldn't we get rid of all of these jihadists and this violence? After learning what you've heard tonight, what do you think? No. You're all right. No, it's not going to help because they're starting to read more and focus more on the violent verses. So what is the hope? Is there any hope? The hope doesn't come from inside Islam, uh, Orthodox Islam. There are two hopes I can think of. One is secularism, them just to become nominal Muslims like we meet everywhere. So I really hope that Muslims become more secular. There have been secular Muslim states like um, Iran under the Shah. And there are a few others that call themselves secular, but they're still kind of Muslim. But they're not as, um, quote, an Islamic Republic, which most are. So we, we would really like them to become secular. The other hope is what they call secondary precepts. And I have read these from some Iranian reformers. And I think it's going to be tough to get this accepted on a wide basis, because the secondary precepts say, well, the Quran was written in a certain way at a certain time to accomplish a certain purpose. But Really, God isn't like that overall. Really, God is more peaceful, and he is more in favor of human rights. So rather than the primary precepts which we learned in Islam, we need to adapt those to modern society. And we'll call those secondary precepts. Basically, they come out of Islam having been in contact with the West, about Iran having been very secular under the Shah and now being in this terrible extremist situation, and in contact with Christians and the Christian idea of God. In fact, some of my students, well, one of them has taken Christian poetry and ideas and substituted Allah in it and sent it to me. So they, these ideas really are permeating both into the secular Islam and into this idea called secondary precepts. Of course, what is our main hope for Islam? That everyone will convert and become Christians and read the Bible and live according to it and love their neighbors and be peaceful. But short of that, since that's not likely to happen, really, I hate to say it, but otherwise we can hope for secularization and secondary precepts. Separate Islam from the Muslim people. Islam is the problem, the teaching of the Quran is a problem, the teaching of Muhammad is a problem, Muhammad as being example to all mankind is a problem, but the Muslim people are victim of this religion. Without the gospel message, we cannot do anything. I don't think United States government or military or any uh, United Nation or anyone can succeed to destroy Islam. I do believe the only one who can do that is Jesus Christ through the gospel message. We, I, I really believe even terrorists, even leaders of Islamic terrorism, even the leaders of Hamas, even all these people, I do believe from all my heart that the Lord is able to bring them to know Christ as the Lord and Savior. And those that they were willing to die for Islam before, they will be willing to die for the gospel, but not carrying a sword, but carrying the good news to preach the gospel to their own people. Mm -hmm.